What is going on everybody? Welcome back to week two or episode two, however you want to call it, for the Terraform for Everyone course on YouTube. Now, if you're new here, feel free to take a look at episode one where I essentially break down a little bit of lecture, a little bit of hands-on stuff around Terraform, what it is and why it's important. So the first thing that we're gonna take a look at today is how to set up an environment. Now, in terms of like the environment setup and stuff in general and the installation and all that good stuff, it's pretty similar com like between different operating systems and stuff. Like if you're using Windows, if you're using Linux, if you're using Mac OS, I would say that it's definitely pretty similar for the configuration. So if you go to this link here, learn.hashicorp.com slash tutorials slash terraform slash install hyphen cli you're going to get this installation page and there's a video here or you can just go straight down to the install terraform now there is a way to manually install it if you want to use like you know from source and you want to use you know like maybe like a make file or something like that or just pre-compiled binaries compile it from source etc that's available but if you want to use a little bit of an easier way, they have different setups here for Windows, for Mac OS, and for Linux. So let's start with Mac OS. You're just going to use Brew. So if you don't know what Brew is, it's a package manager for Mac OS. And then you're just going to tap the HashiCorp repo, and then you're going to install it. So Brew install HashiCorp slash tap slash Terraform. Okay. On Windows, you're going to use Chocolatey. And if you're not familiar with Chocolatey, it's a package manager for Windows. So you're just going to do Choco install Terraform. And then finally, you have Linux. So what's really cool about this is if you're using Ubuntu, like an aptitude-based system, if you're using CentOS, RHEL, Fedora, Amazon Linux, that's all here for you. So let's just look at the Ubuntu one really quick. So first, you're going to do an apt update, you're gonna do an apt install of the software properties. You're gonna add the GPG key for HashiCorp. You're gonna add the official HashiCorp Linux repo to your aptitude package manager. And then you're gonna go ahead and you're gonna add the repository and install the Terraform CLI. So as you can see, if we look at like, I don't know, CentOS for example, it's pretty similar. Uh, it's actually a little bit shorter. Amazon Linux. Amazon Linux uh, and Fedora, well, Amazon Linux, CentOS, RHEL, they're all based on that, you know, RHEL-based Linux operating system. So you're going to be using the Yum Package Manager here. So once that's installed, what you'll be able to do is you'll be able to run, you know, Terraform, for example, and that's going to be on your path. Now, that's a super crucial thing here. If you go through and you use like a make file, you compile it from source, you're not going to have Terraform on your path. So if you like type Terraform, for example, it might not pop up. It might say it's not found. So if you see that, but you know Terraform is installed, just ensure that it is on your path. Okay, next, you're going to need a code editor or a text editor. Now, I typically use VS Code depending on the language. You know, like if I'm using Py Python, sometimes I like PyCharm. If I'm using Go, sometimes I like Goland, but in terms of like Terraform and pretty much my day to day, I would say I'm usually in VS Code. So depending on the operating system that you're on, you can download it for Windows, Linux, or Mac OS. Now, once you have that installed, you're going to be ready to go ahead and start writing some code. Now, don't look at this just yet. I just want to point something out here. I know I pointed out in the first video, but I do want to point it out again here. If you click on the extensions, and you type Terraform, you're gonna see the official Terraform extension by HashiCorp. So you're gonna to wanna to go ahead and install that. It's gonna help for some syntax highlighting, auto completion, and the extension is enabled globally for VS Code. So now that we kinda of know how to get this environment set up and up and running and operational, what we wanna do is we wanna look at some Terraform code. This is actually code from my open source project on GitHub called DevOps the Hard Way. You can go ahead and you can look that up on GitHub. It's open source, so you can fork it. Uh, you can copy the repo, play with the code, etc. But what I wanted to do is, in the first lesson, I showed a little bit of, you know, 
what the syntax kind of looks like for Terraform, all of that good stuff. But I really want to dive a little bit deeper here. So as you can see, a lot of Terraform is parameter based or key value pair based. So, you know, you have a key and then you have a value. And then if we scroll down here under required providers, we're going to go through that. Don't worry. Key value. Okay. So that's essentially what the language looks like. So why is it written like this? What exactly is this Terraform code? So people will typically say, Hey, I'm writing Terraform code, but if you dive in a little bit more, they're actually writing HCL or HashiCorp configuration language. So if you take a look at this here, let me just zoom in a bit. I'm actually on the HashiCorp Git org and then I'm under HCL here. This is open source. So you can go ahead and you can take a look at this. And if you read this, it says HCL is a toolkit for creating structured configuration language that are both human and machine friendly for use with command line tools. And I want to say that HCL was created with one primary thing in mind. Well, 90% in mind to be human readable. Okay, they wanted everybody to be able to come in here and write infrastructure as code. Now this could be the sysadmin that's never touched code before. This could be the developer that maybe typically writes in Python or Go, but wants to be able to automate some of those systems and services in the cloud or on-prem. HashiCorp wanted to make this language to essentially say everybody and anybody can use it. Don't worry. You don't have to have a computer science degree. You don't have to be an expert programmer. This should be human readable by everybody. And that's typically why it reads like this key value pair. Cause this is pretty straightforward and simple to understand. Now scrolling down here, there's some different examples and all of that good stuff. So this is going to go into the weeds a little bit and talk about the ghost structs and the types and everything else. Now you don't need to know this. However, what I will say is if you are interested in it, definitely check it out. Go is a really cool language. I love writing in it. HCL and Terraform is written in Go. So it's really cool to understand that at, you know, at least a high level. Okay, back to the code. So at this point, I want to break this down a little bit. Now this is a common style configuration that you're going to see in probably HashiCorp 1.0 and above. So first I'm specifying a Terraform block. So anytime that you see these brackets here like this, this is a block. Okay. And then you could have blocks inside of blocks. So like nested blocks, exactly like we have for backend and required providers. So let's kind of think about this for a little bit and we're going to go over this as well. But when you write Terraform code and you create a configuration, you know about that configuration, but what about other people's machines? What about if somebody needs to, you know, go and update something or they need to go and create something, but maybe you already created it, or maybe they just want to go and they just want to update it or something. Instead of doing that manually, they want to be able to use something like Terraform. But here's the problem. There must be a source of truth because you don't want configuration drift. So that source of truth has to live somewhere and where it lives, is in a TF state or a TF state file. Okay. So this backend configuration here is to store the TF state file. Now we're going to look at a TF state file in just a second here, but I did just want to show you this. Okay. But a TF state file is essentially just metadata of your configuration. So no configuration drift occurs. Okay. So as you can see, the backend is S3. And the reason why is because this is an AWS configuration. So I'm actually using an S3 bucket to store my configuration and I'm specifying the bucket, which is Terraform state DevOps the hard way. I'm specifying a key and that key is going to be the file name and then the region where the S3 bucket exists. Now in Azure, you can do the same thing. You can have a backend of an Azure storage account. So next here we have required providers. Now remember in episode one of this series, we talked about providers and providers essentially just allow you to make API calls at the programmatic level to different services like AWS. So as we can see here, I'm specifying AWS as the source. This is the required provider needed to run this code. Why? Because this is code for 
AWS. So scrolling down here, I can then specify my provider. So my provider is AWS and some resources require mandatory parameters. So in this case, it's, it's a provider, but it's a provider block or a provider resource. And what it requires is the region. So the region must be specified in the provider, which I do here. Okay. So again, if I highlight this, notice how it says a provider block. If I hover over resource, a resource block. Okay, let's do the same thing up here, backend. Backend configuration, it doesn't say block, of course. Here, required providers block. Okay, oh, sorry, it actually does backend block. So my point is, remember how I said in the beginning that anytime that you see these brackets, it's a block. That means that there's some code inside of that configuration that's you know filled with parameters and key value pairs and even nested blocks like we have here on lines nine through, or I'm sorry, on lines two through 10, okay? So then I have one resource in here. Now my resource is an ECR repository. And if you've already guessed it, you may be right. We're creating an elastic container registry or ECR with Terraform. And we talked about this a little bit, like we could see this is a, an embedded block here, and we talked about different resources and key value pairs, which are you know these parameters and all that good stuff. But see how I have var dot repo underscore name. And that's because I have a variable, and that variable is the repo name. So let's go ahead and take a look at that variable here in the variables.tf file. Now I have a variable block, and it's of type string. Remember we spoke about types in episode one. I have a default here, that's the default value of this variable. And then I have a description here, just a metadata description. Now, here's the thing. What if you wanna be able to specify the value of this variable in a different way? You don't wanna just set a default because that's kind of the same thing as just setting a static value, right? And we want our code to be repeatable, so that's really not the best thing in the world. So how can we do it? Well. There's one of two ways that we could essentially set this up. Now, if I'm on the terminal here, and we're gonna talk about the init command, apply, et cetera, but if I'm here and I use Terraform apply or plan, again, we're gonna talk about it, but Terraform apply is to create a resource, all right? And if I type var equals double quotes, I can specify the variable here. So I can say repo underscore name equals whatever the value is of the variable, okay? So we could pass in variables that way, or we can pass in variables through what I like to call, you know, almost a runtime file. So you're passing in these values at runtime, and you can do that with a file that ends in .tf vars. So notice here how I have a repo name, it says repo name equals a value. So if I wanted to, if I didn't want to use, you know, the var command on the terminal, what I could do is I could have this file set up that ends in .tf vars, specify what the variable values should be. And then one other thing that I want to show you before we wrap up is our tf state file. So I already ran this configuration. I'm not going to run the configuration yet. I want to show you that in the next video. But if I go to the file explorer here and under my ECR module, what I want to do is I want to go to dot terraform. Now when you run a terraform init which initializes the module, it's going to create this dot terraform file and it's going to install the provider. Now remember we specified the provider in our terraform configuration and a provider, funny enough, is just simply a PKG or an EXE if you're on Windows. That's it. And this TF state here, this is our metadata configuration file. This is everything that makes up our Terraform module for ECR. And this gets created when you run the configuration. Now actually, one more thing I wanna show you before we go is modules, okay? So remember in the first video, we spoke about this a little bit, but I wanted to reiterate now a module is a container for multiple resources that are used together. Modules can be used to create lightweight abstractions so that you can describe your infrastructure in terms of architecture rather than directly in terms of physical objects. So 
what I what they essentially mean by that is you see this folder here and this folder has you know the terraform provider and the tf state and it has the main tf and the tf bars and the variables this right here the directory called ecr with these files that's a module and that module can be used as standalone or the module could even be called upon from other modules like the eks hyphen fargate module so with that that's going to go ahead and wrap up week two i hope everybody enjoyed this episode next week we're going to be talking about and setting up Terraform Cloud. Thanks for listening, everybody. Take care.